Good morning, brothers and sisters. As we prepare to again study into Judges chapter 6, shall we ask our Heavenly Father for his guidance, for his wisdom, and for his blessing, so that we may more directly understand that which is being shown and what is important for us to understand today. Shall we pray? Gracious Father in heaven, as we come before you today, we thank you for these many opportunities that you are giving. For minds that have been long darkened by sin, to understand lessons from your word. We thank you, Father, for the blessings that you are providing. We thank you for this opportunity we have to gather together. We ask now for your guidance so that we may understand your word, that we may eat your flesh and drink your blood. And may come so that we may more directly be able to offer these lessons to those within this dying world. May your spirit guide us. May your angels attend us. Help us now that our minds may be open and ready and willing to receive the lessons that you would provide us. For this we ask, for this we pray, in Jesus' name, amen. Now, continuing the overview that we find in Signs of the Times, 23rd of June, 1881. We might expect the Israelites to harden their hearts against the reproofs of the prophet. We listen to hear them respond. We do not wish to be continually reminded of our sins. Speak to us words of peace, of encouragement, and hope, but do not keep ever before us the dismal relation of our backsliding. How often do the pro professed people of God at the present day turn away from instruction and neglect oft-repeated warnings? They dislike to be reminded of their defects of character. They are unwilling to be reproved for their pride and their idolatry and turning from the requirements of God to seek the gains, the friendship, or the pleasures of this world. How often in the movement today are we offended by others that are much like ourselves? One of the points that Mrs. White is very direct upon is something that my mother has said to me many times. The faults you see in others are those that most need correcting in yourself. And sometimes I think that what's happening within the movement is when we have someone that is showing a fault that we are holding on to, that we wish to run away from listening to them because we're too afraid that we might have to give up our own faults. Such was the manner in which some of the Israelites received the message of reproof. Had the people been enjoying prosperity, this feeling of rebellion would, no doubt, have been general. But in their distress from the oppression of their enemies, with want and even starvation staring them in the face, they felt their need of help from God. They knew that unless he, whom they had so dishonored, should manifest his power for their deliverance, they must perish. In deep humility, they accepted the message of reproof, confessed their sins, and implored the mercy of the Most High. 
Their prayers were heard, and again the Lord sent forth the man of his choice to act as a deliverer for Israel. The one thus selected was Gideon of the tribe of Manasseh. The Midianites had swept like a devouring plague over the land. It was only with the greatest difficulty that the Hebrews could secrete sufficient food to save them from actual starvation. Gideon had, however, retained possession of a small quantity of wheat and fearing to beat it out in the threshing floor, he had taken it to the vineyard near the wine press. The time of ripe grapes was being far off. The attention of the Midianites would not be directed to that place. Sometimes I look at our morning meetings and our Sabbath meetings very much as a time of Gideon. Because if we were in the corporate church, would we be fed? Would we be given anything less than watered down milk where at this time in earth's history we need meat? As he thus labored in secrecy and silence, he sadly meditated upon the condition of Israel. Is that not what we find ourselves doing today? Are we not meditating upon not only the condition of the church and the movement, but our own selves? He thought of her glorious triumphs in the past, of her present abject condition, and of the still darker prospect for the future, and his spirit was stirred within him. With deep earnestness, he considered how the oppressor's yoke might be broken off from his people. To all appearances, this was impossible. The Israelites were disheartened and discouraged. They had dishonored God by their idolatry. And they felt little confidence that he would work for them. Gideon almost despaired of inspiring the people with faith or courage, but he knew that the Lord would work mightily for Israel as he had done in the past. His whole soul cried out after God. He felt that although he might stand alone, <clears throat> yet if he had the assurance that God was with him, he would not fear to strike a blow against the oppressors. Any comments? Any thoughts? Well, I mean, it is definitely um, how we would uh, feel, you know, especially with the July 18, 2020 prediction. I'm looking not only at July 18, I'm looking at December 6, I'm looking at all of the actions that have gone on since then. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, so dealing with that prediction, um, that that would be how we would feel. While Gideon's mind was absorbed in meditations like these, suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared to him and addressed him with the words, The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. The melancholy nature of Gideon's thoughts. Oh, excuse me. Don't know why they did this. The melancholy nature of Gideon's thoughts is revealed by his answer. Oh, my Lord, if the Lord be with us, why then is all this befallen us? All his miracles, which our fathers told us of, saying, did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord hath forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. The messenger of heaven replied, 
go in this thy go in this thy might and thou shalt save Israel from the hand of the Midianites have I not sent thee with a sense of his own unfitness for so important a work Gideon exclaimed O my Lord wherewith shall I save Israel behold my family is poor in Manasseh and I am the least in my father's house. Then the angel gave him the gracious assurance, surely I will be with thee, and thou shalt smite the Midianites as one man. Gideon desired some token that the one now addressing him was the same that spoke to Moses in the burning bush. The angel had veiled the divine glory of his presence, but it was no other than Christ, the Son of God. When a prophet or an angel delivered a divine message, his words were, The Lord saith, I will do this. But it is stated of the person who talked with Gideon, The Lord said unto him, I will be with thee. Desiring to show special honor to his illustrious visitor and having obtained the assurance that the angel would tarry, Gideon hastened to his tent and out of his scanty store prepared a kid and unleavened cakes, which he brought forth to set before him. Gideon was poor, yet he was ready to use hospitality without grudging. As the gift was presented, the angel said, Take the flesh and eleven cakes and lay them on this rock and pour out the broth. Gideon did so, and then the Lord gave him the sign which he desired. With the staff in his hand, the angel touched the flesh and the unleavened cakes, and a fire rose up out of the rock and consumed the whole as a sacrifice and not as a hospitable meal, for he was God and not man. After this token of his divine character, the angel disappeared. Now, yesterday as we were, as we were working through these verses, we were having conversations. We do not know who the prophet what that was that was sent, who this prophet was. We know he was a man. We know he was a prophet. In verse 8, that the Lord sent a prophet unto the children of Israel, which said unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I brought you up from Egypt and brought you forth out of the house of bondage. And I delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of all that oppressed you and drave them out from before you and gave you their land. And I said unto you, I am the Lord your God. Fear not the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell, that ye have not obeyed my voice. How do we apply the admonition that ye have not obeyed my voice to us, to ourselves today? Do we have a literal admonition? Do we have a figurative admonition? How should we see this? Well, okay, so we still haven't really decided exactly what's being represented here. But, I mean, we haven't obeyed the Lord's voice. I mean, it's not a literal voice, it's his word. But, um, so I'm not sure what you mean by literal or spiritual. Okay, we've got this whole section. We have not yet decided how this application is going to be made. So what, how, how should we go about this? Well, 
I mean, there's ideas that we have because we've studied Gideon before in the past. So Jeff had an understanding of, of Gideon. And then he made a further application of that when it came to uh, the July 18, 2020 prediction. And, you know, as we discussed yesterday, we know that, um, at least my view, is that this can't be just a reiteration of the other enemies. This has to be a different enemy that was left in the land. And in this case, it's going to be the Moabites. Right? Or the Midianites, I mean, Midianites. So this is gonna, yeah, this is going to be the Midianites. I knew I was saying the wrong thing. Uh, the Midianites, which are um, a fairly close family relationship. And we're going to see it even gets closer as time goes in the next one. But um, now these, of course, are the groups that are on the other side of the Jordan, you know, on the east side, not on the west side. And so there has to be something to that because we've had these different locations um, where we have these judges being raised up. We also have uh, the seven years symbolism. So I, I would you know, place this in connection with, of course, July 18th and um, on that part of the message. And we know that he's going to be whittled down. So there's a whittling down. So exactly where this would start and exactly what error it is that's being addressed, what false message is being addressed and what the true message is. Um, I mean, it's going to take time to sort through that. But I, I think as far as not obeying God's voice, I mean, this would be something within the movement again. I'm not disagreeing. Right. So we would have to figure out exactly what it is that was not being obeyed. And of course, this other prophet um, who has given this message that this message then is based upon. So that this means this message follows another message. So it could be the second angel's message. All right. Right. Which, which would be this movement. Uh, the aspect of this movement after 9-11. Okay, so as we were saying yesterday, there's a lot of pieces on the table. We just haven't been able to put them in any kind of semblance of order. Mm -hmm. And there came an angel of the Lord and sat under an oak, which was in Ophrah, that pertaineth unto Joash, the Abiazite, and his son Gideon threshed wheat by the winepress to hide it from the Midianites. What symbolism is there? That the angel of the Lord, as we now know, is Christ. That he sat under an oak. And its location was in Ophrah. What can we determine from this? Okay, so... I think we had done something with this before, but I can't remember what it was. So I guess it's good we're going over this again. No, Joshua, uh, what is that? Joshua 24, they set it up under an oak. Joshua 24, I remember reading that. First Kings, <clears throat> First Kings thirteen, the man of God from Bethel was beneath an oak, right? <clears throat> or was it the disobedient prophet he found beneath an oak? 
Oh, it's one or the other. I think our problem is we don't believe sometimes that God is actually presenting these truths to us. And because we receive ridicule and disdain and rejection from, from others, we have to have a constant assurance that it's God who's giving us these, these truths. We need to stand firm on that. How often within the church has this movement been <clears throat> ridiculed? Well, I'm sure a lot of times, but I've separated it from it. And uh, if they want to revile what God has sent, then their blood be upon their own heads. I say, I keep telling people, search for yourself. Okay, so we're, sit, we're seeing that the angel of the Lord, the messenger of the Lord, Malak, Hebrew 4397. The word also can mean a prophet, a priest, or a teacher, but also ambassador, angel, king, or messenger. What were the roles of Christ? Or should I say it this way? What were the roles of Samuel? <clears throat> Samuel was prophet, priest, and judge, wasn't he? Yes, he was. So what were the roles of Christ? Prophet, priest, and king. Right. So this word being given here, this angel of the Lord is foreshadowing Christ's coming to the earth as prophet, priest, and king. He sat under an oak. But the word that is used here is used 13 other times in scripture, but it is the feminine version of another word. So why would Christ sit under something that is described in the feminine? I mean, well, oaks have to be in the feminine. You don't have a mask of an oak. Okay. Uh, so I don't know if that makes much of a difference here. I'm asking, is, is this not a symbol of a church? How would you see it? In the sense that Christ said that he that is greatest among you shall be your servant. And the son of man came not to you know, serve himself, but to serve us then he would be taking that, you know, that low seat. He gave an example of people that take the high seat and exalt themselves and they're brought low. So he that will lead others must be servant of all. And Christ so is that. We have Christ sitting under an oak described in the feminine, which was in Ophrah, which is the feminine of another word that means female fawn. Yeah, why are you focusing on the feminine? I don't, because you're trying to say it's a church? No, I'm, I'm trying to put the pieces together. Okay, I just don't think it matters that it's a feminine. That's all I'm saying. Okay. Right, because... Uh, it's not... Uh, Basically, it's not something that is going to be of civil authority. Yeah, well, I don't think this has to do with authority at all. I think these are other types of symbols. Okay, so what type of symbols are they? Well, okay, when we look at an oak, the first time this is mentioned is in Genesis 54, 4. They gave unto Jacob all the strange, god, strange gods which were in their hand and all their earrings which were in their ears, and Jacob hid them under the oak, which was by Shechem.
So that's the first time we have Oak. Now we have Oak mentioned again the second time in Judges 6.11, Judges 6.19, and then you're going to see it again in 2 Samuel and 1 Kings and Chronicles and Isaiah and Ezekiel. Um, so, so those are, and then in Hoshea and Isaiah, it's called uh, an Elms in Hoshea, was Hosea, I mean, and in Isaiah, it's going to be uh, a teal tree. So, okay, so in this, in the first instance that we find this with Jacob, where he removes the idols, the earrings, etc., and puts them under the oak at Shechem. Yeah. Is that an area that pertained to Judah, or was that an area that pertained to Manasseh? Um, Shechem is... Uh, um, Let me see here. I can't remember. Manasseh. It's it's located in the valley between Mount Ebo and Mount Gerizim. Okay. And Ophrah. Okay. They're both in Manasseh. Um, yeah. So, yeah. So they're both in Manasseh. So this is actually, yeah, near Shechem. Oprah is near Shechem. Is it possible that this could be the same oak? Well, it's possible. The symbolism here would be that Jacob removed the earrings and removed the idols from his family. And <clears throat> Christ came because the children of Israel had again accepted the idols mm -hmm. that they were supposed to, to have abandoned. Yeah, because that's what this story is going to be about. Ophra. In this situation, as I said, as a I mean, Hebrew 6084 is supposed to be that of a female fawn, but it comes as the feminine of Hebrew 6082. Yeah, well, yeah, because that's a color. So the dusty color that, um, that is the color of a young roe, a heart, or a fawn, right? That's what it's named after. So it's not it's not a type of a doubling. Type of a doubling. The feminine color and then the feminine fawn, female fawn. No. Okay. Now this oak was in Ophra that pertained unto Joash. Joash being the father of Gideon. What is the name of Joash's meaning and what is the symbolism of him being an Abizarite? What do those names mean? Okay, so um, what means given by the Lord, um, and this is based upon, 
Yehoash. What's the name? Two Israelite kings. All right. So the Abizarite or Abizarite, the father of the Ezrite. My father is help. So one of my, the family my, of Abiezer, descendant of Joseph's son Manasseh, which we had looked at before. Okay. So we have Gideon, who is a feller or a warrior. So this warrior is descended from the father of health. Does Gideon's message bring health to those that accept it? So is Gideon's message a type of the third angel's message? No. Okay. Uh, it, this is the second angel's message still. At least that's my understanding of it. But, you know, I could be wrong. Hmm. I'd have to think about that, maybe. Okay. So now. And the angel of the Lord, as we now know is Christ, appeared unto him and said unto him, The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. The translators would look, have looked at it in the following. They would have looked at Judges 13.3, Luke 1.11, Luke 1.28. Judges 13.3, which we will be getting into in, in a few weeks. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto the woman and said unto her, Behold now, thou art barren and bearest not, but thou shalt conceive and bear a son. Now we have Luke 1.11. And there appeared unto him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. Luke 1, 28. And the angel said unto her, and said, and the angel came into, unto her and said, Hail, thou that art highly favored. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. Gideon is having the same experience. As Mary. As the father of John the Baptist. And also. I believe this is the mother of Samson, isn't it? In Judges 13, 3. Um,
Yeah. So in each case, something miraculous is, going, is happening here. Where Samson is concerned, this angel of the Lord appears unto the woman and said unto her, Behold, now thou art barren and bearest not. So it's a miracle that she had a child. Luke 111, John's father, sees an angel standing on the right side of the altar of incense. So if we were to envision the holy place and someone is standing to the right side of the altar of incense, what are they standing between? Where are they standing? Well, if you're on if you're on the right side of the altar of incense in the sanctuary, you're going to have the table of showbread. You're going to be between the table of showbread and the altar. Is that what you mean? Exactly true. Okay. And you're going to stand in front of what? Well, you're standing before the veil. Is that what you mean? I'm, you're standing not only before the veil, but is that also not the entrance into the most holy? Yeah. The symbolism of that position symbolizes Christ. Because he is our intercessor. Therefore, he is by the altar of incense. He is our king because he is by the table of showbread. He is our intercessor and he is our way into the most holy because he is standing in front of the veil and the entrance into the most holy. Each of these other verses are pointing out the miracles that are now occurring. Now the promise that was given to Joshua in Joshua 1 verse 5 there shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee nor forsake thee. When we return to this verse, the promise that is given is the Lord is with thee. It is the same promise that was given to Moses in leading the children of Israel, here is Gideon today receiving this promise. He is being told that he is a mighty man of valor. Recording stopped. We'll give him a couple of minutes to come back up. Yeah. So on uh, my other computer, it says it's connecting. The one that's doing the recording. So. Okay. Um, so if you can just wait to see why well, my internet looks like it's okay. I'm not sure why I did that. I've been having major problems since I got up this morning really early with mine upstairs. That supposedly was fixed yesterday. And I think it's an, an attack of Satan. I've been praying against it because the message I was about to post is very, very important on Facebook. And I just cannot do it right now. Okay. Okay. So for some reason, my internet on my laptop is disconnected. I'm going to reboot my router. So we're going to be disconnected completely. Um, but this way I can keep the recording. So just 
keep your thoughts uh, and I'll be right back. It'll be right. Kind of interesting to go back over this. I mean, as, as we are, have been applying multiple times, that symbols can have more than one meaning. So as we have been going through this in this part of the study, mm -hmm. I'm having to ask myself, is there a secondary or tertiary meaning to what we're finding here within the book of Gideon? Or excuse me, the book of Judges in the story of Gideon. So there's, there's quite a bit yet to look at. One thing that really stands out to me is the angel Christ addressed him as mighty man of valor. Like God sees in us qualities that we don't see. You know, he sees us as we could be as we follow him. And that is so in, encouraging. But because we're weak and frail and human, and of this earth, sometimes we have to have a sign of that, that, that assurance. We just don't take him at his word as we ought to. So he, in his pity and patience, will give us a sign. Right. It's a good point. But in this, in this situation, it's also kind of interesting because when we're looking at Judges 6.12, we have a total of four different examples that are being shown where people miraculously have an encounter with an angel or with Christ. Recording in progress. So in this situation, with what we're seeing in Judges 6.12, with the four different examples that we are being shown, each of them is miraculous. Each of them is offering us something for our consideration in reference to this particular study. And Gideon said unto him, O my Lord, if the Lord be with us, why then is all this befallen us? And where be all his miracles, which our fathers told us of, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord hath forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. How much, and there's no other way for me to say this, how much should spa did it take for Gideon, not realizing who he's talking to, to say that the Lord has abandoned us when Christ was the leader of the children of Israel coming out of Egypt? I mean, yes, this shows the man's mental state at this time. At the same time, we need to recall that Christ himself to fulfill prophecy said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? You know, even Christ cried out, my God, why have you abandoned me? We don't have that experience because here is christ so close with the father and on the cross he was then separated completely from this with his father there was nothing showing him of his father's approval of his father's presence anything now In this movement, as we recognize that July 18th, had it occurred the way that we thought it was going to occur, it would have lifted up a people 
who did not have at that time the proper character to be so lifted. Here is Gideon. Oh, my Lord, if the Lord be with us. Saying this to Christ. That he was not being with the children of Israel. Isn't this saying that, hey, we really haven't done anything wrong. We don't deserve this. What else can we see from this verse? What else is there? Had God forsaken them? Well, no, but... Um... Okay, so Gideon's not really uh, like many of the people. They, he doesn't really understand what's happening. Like how far they have departed. Right. Right, so, so he knows about the miracles and what God has done in the past, but he doesn't fully understand their spiritual condition. He doesn't understand their spiritual condition, yet he sees it all the way around him. But does he accept that? Hmm. Is there not a type of spiritual blindness? with Gideon at this point. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's just definitely a spiritual blindness, which which is the one thing that is, um, you know, it's the problem with Adventism in general and, and with this movement. I mean, it's easy, as I pointed out many times, it's easy to see the faults of others, but not to see the faults of ourselves. It's easy to point out other people's errors, but much more difficult to recognize where we are in error. And, and that's what this message is supposed to do, is correct us. And yet we're not seeking to be corrected at all. We're seeking to correct others. We think that we're all okay. And that's why we have this spirit manifested in this movement the shunning of others, this lack of being able to listen, um, you know, and, and when we're rebuked, the question is, how do we, how do we respond to that rebuke? You know, are we going to look at ourselves and see, yeah, there's truth in that. And, and, and there's many who would like to point out rebukes but they're not willing to do the work necessary with a person. Uh, so there's one thing to say, well, this person is in error, but what are you going to do to help that person? And, and the first thing that you have to do is help yourself. You have to see your error. You have to see where you're wrong because we have this division in this movement, these conflicts that exist. And the question is, what are we doing to try to resolve them? What is it that we are doing in ourselves to try to figure out where we have departed from what God has given us to do um, so that we can actually help others? And, you know, I believe that the remedy is, is the type of study that we are doing because it brings that type of conviction and it brings that type of change. Okay. Okay. 
is this spiritual blindness seen today within the movement? Mm -hmm. You know, and, and of course, I'm jumping a little bit ahead, but, you know, after Gideon, we're going to see that we have Abimelech's conspiracy. And I think that these both are related to each other. All right. Right. So the one follows the other. And and so in my understanding, in, in understanding these, trying to put this together, is that this relates to the July 18, 2020 prediction. The remedy that God is giving us here. Um, but Abimelech's conspiracy is going to represent something that happens after July 18. Which be more directly relate to where we are now. Okay, that's the way that I've understood it. But uh, you know, I could be corrected on that. And the Lord looked at him and said, "Go in this thy might, and thou shalt save Israel from the hand of the Midianites." Have not I sent thee? Now, the translators looked at this with the go in this thy might. And we're applying 1 Samuel 12, 11. And this is a recap of what, what we're going to be studying right now. And the Lord sent Jerubal and Bedan and Jephthah and Samuel and delivered you out of the hand of your enemies on every side and ye dwelled safe. Then we have Hebrews 1132 and 1134. And what shall I more say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and of Barak and of Samson and of Jephthah of David also, and Samuel, and of all the prophets. Quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, and out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Okay, so in, in this um, here, so they have this list. So we know that Jerusalem, Jerubal, that's Gideon, right? Right. So, so it's just another way of saying Gideon. Bedan, would um, because in that list you got basically Gideon, Bedan, Jephthah, and Samuel. The other ones: Gideon, Barak, Samson, and Jephthah. Right. David also, and Samuel, and of the prophets. So these are different. You know, one of course is from. The book of Hebrews, the other one from for Samuel. Um, because Bedan was the son a son of Gilead, the son of Machir, the son of Manasseh. Right. But who is he? What's where's that story? We're only finding his name brought up here and in Chronicles. Right. Yeah. Now, his name um, does mean a son of Dan. At least some people say that's what it means is a son of Dan. And some people think it refers to Samson. And some also apply it to Barak. So there's other different ways in which this is understood. And some people put Samson instead of Samuel, some documents. So, um, I mean, it would make sense that he's Barak, but just another name for him. Outside of his lineage, do we have anything else that would tell us what this name means? What, what the name means yeah um well according to brown it means in judging because dan means a judge 
and it has the bet at the beginning, which means in. Um, so so that's all all we know about it. I also I also have meaning fat and robust. Bidan means fat and robust. Where do you get that? And that's the exhaustive dictionary of Bible names. Hmm. And they're taking that spelling, like like the, and they're using it as the B Dan here from First Samuel twelve eleven. Where do they give a reference? Just doesn't yeah, make it just sense. has an EMB down. Yeah, I don't know. I don't see how it can mean fat unless you know there's some relationship to, to judging as being fat. But because in Hebrew it is bidan, which is in judge or in judging. Okay. Yeah, sometimes I'm never sure where these dictionary level names gets their definitions. Wish they'd show the etymology. Well, the one I was looking at was calling Bidan as servile. Yeah, well, they're taking that from Abdon. So that that's po possible, I guess. That I don't see it from the Hebrew, really. Okay. So the challenge is given to Gideon. Have I not sent thee? And he and Gideon said unto Christ, O my Lord, wherewith shall I save Israel? Behold, my family is poor in Manasseh, or my thousand is the meanest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. Why would he see himself as being the least in his father's house? What's being addressed here? In preparing for this, there are several verses that the translators suggested be compared with what we're talking about here in Judges 6.15. We would have Exodus 18.21. Moreover, thou shalt provide out of all the people able men, such as fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness, and place such over them to be rulers of thousands and rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties and rulers of tens. Exodus 18, 25. Mm -hmm. And Moses chose able men out of all Israel and made them heads of over the people, rulers of thousands, rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties and rulers of tens. Hating covetousness. Hating the sin that Balaam had. Hating the sin of Judas. Hating the sin of Achan. Now we have Micah 5 2. But now Bethlehem. Ephrata, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me that is to be ruler in Israel, whose going forth have been from old, 
from everlasting. Moses was to choose able men that fear God to be their leaders, that hated covetousness. God chose out of Bethlehem the ruler of Israel, not the temporal ruler that they had hoped for but the spiritual ruler that they needed. Here's Gideon. His family is not wealthy. His tribe is not powerful. His section of the land has been overrun by the enemy. And yet God sees something in him to choose him for the work that is to be done. What applications can we place here? What are your thoughts? What direction can we take here? What is this saying to the movement today? What is it saying to us personally today? Well, I mean, we're not looking for the great leaders of this, of the church or whatever to, to lead this movement. It's in the little things. Um, it's in the minority, I guess. Uh, the truth will be found. Okay. Yes, we have connected it, or Jeff did, I think, to William Miller at the end of the Seven Times, ending 1798. And then we can maybe apply it to Jeff himself, 1989. Mm -hmm. Yeah, saying that, you know, Jeff is basically, he's not anybody. Correct? That, that's what your the application. Yes. Okay. Miller. His word is, as a name, he's separating wheat from tares. And you had Gideon there at the threshing floor doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. Although he was threshing, although it was in the, uh, maybe it wasn't the threshing floor, it was where the, the vineyard was, the, yeah. the wine press. But it's definitely a message that does a separation. But it's a message, the separation here with this message is coming in the area of the wine press, of the area of the doctrine. The old looks like the old paths. Okay. Can you explain your point? I was just reading down the mic at 5 2 there. It said, uh, going from of old, from everlasting. Well, I look at old. this where, where it's coming from the old and everlasting as being part of the gospel directly. Yeah. All right. 
right? And the Lord said unto him, Surely I will be with thee, and thou shalt smite the Midianites as one man. And he said unto him, If now I have found grace in thy sight, then show me a sign that thou talkest with me. Depart not hence, I pray thee, until I come unto thee, and bring forth my present, and set it before thee. And he said, I will tarry until thou come again. So here is Gideon. He is going to bring forth his present. What's another way of saying a present? How else should this be looked at? Isn't Gideon bringing an offering? Mm -hmm. So he's bringing an offering. So, and Gideon went in and made ready a kid or a kid of the goats and unleavened cakes of an ephah of flour. The flesh he put in a basket, and he put the broth in a pot, and brought it out unto him under the oak, and presented it. And the angel of God said unto him, Take the flesh and the unleavened cakes, and lay them upon this rock and pour out the broth. And he did so. This is a symbol of what? Well, this is a sacrifice. Right. Gideon thinks he's making a meal, that he's being hospitable. Mm -hmm. But he's providing a type of a sacrifice. The flesh is fairly simple to see. This is the same as the sacrifice. But the unleavened cakes, what are they a symbol of? The life of no uh, without sin, sin in your life. All right. But are the cakes also not what we would find on the table of showbread? Yes. And the broth, he is told to pour it out. What is the broth a symbol of? Christ's blood. I mean, and Christ calls us to present our bodies, ourselves as living sacrifices. Right. And you pour out, when, when the blood is poured out, where is it poured out at? Um, in his case, it is poured down to the foot of the cross. In our case, it's, it's, it's before his, his altar, his calling for us. All right. Then the angel of the Lord put forth the end of the staff that was in his hand and touched the flesh and the unleavened cakes. And there rose up fire out of the rock and consumed the flesh and the unleavened cakes. Then the angel of the Lord departed out of his sight. Why don't they mention anything about the broth?
I mean, Christ does not touch any of this offering. He touches it with his staff. What does the staff symbolize? Does not the staff also symbolize a shepherd's crook, a shepherd's rod, per se, as he leads his people, as he leads his sheep? It could be his, his, his scepter, too, and his, his standard, his rules of guidance, right? The rod of Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Right. Rod, guide, and chastens. Agreed. Here is Christ before Gideon, before a man that is questioning whether God is actually leading. He's questioning July 18th. He's questioning everything that's happened since then. He comes before Gideon. Gideon, I have a message that I need given to all of the people. I have a message that I need given to the movement. I need you to give it. Why? How can I do this when my family is the least within my tribe? Why can I do this when I am in a movement that is not respected? How am I to give this message? My people and my church don't want to listen to it. How can I give this message when I don't have the means? How can I give this message that no one wants to hear? How else can we approach this? In what other manner can we see? One of the things about Elder Jeff's study with Gideon was he was pretty direct about the different symbols that he was seeing at that time and about how Gideon was a lesson for us today. Does it still remain a lesson for us today? Mm -hmm. uh, yes. So if it's still a lesson for us today, what lessons are we taking from this? We well, have I'm, go ahead. Yes. So one thing is obviously God requires a sacrifice. Are we willing to make that sacrifice? Where was and we have to recall, sorry, Dwight, Dwight um, I was going to say that Christ came unto his own, but his own, it seemed no one received him, right? But yet at the end, I mean, we read in Acts that many of the priests came to the faith 
So even though in the beginning, our efforts are seem fruitless, and it seems impossible, we have to believe that the message is of God. God is contained in it. And he has to bring it to per perfection. We're just the instruments. It's not of us. It never has been. <clears throat> Where was Gideon told to place the flesh and the cakes? Well, upon the rock. Specifically this rock. Um, what does the rock symbolize for us well, today well it would be the, the charts the messages from 40 uh, to 44 Ellen White says is the rock of ages Okay. I was thinking that the rock was another symbol of Christ. Well, it is, but but Ellen White says that Christ is understood through through a message. You know, so in, in the sort of I mean it's easy to talk about Christ, but she says, you know, Christ has to be presented to the people in types, in signs, in symbols. Because that's how we understand him or know him. So the charts represent Christ. The messages that were given in Millerite history are, Ellen White says to her, that is the rock of ages. And we know it's Christ, but she's trying to make a point there. That we can't, we can't reject the charts and the messages from Millerite history and not reject Christ. All right. We can't reject the history. We cannot reject the chronology because if we reject either, we are rejecting Palmoni. Mm The broth being poured out symbolizing Christ's blood. Mm -hmm. The broth being poured out symbolizing Christ's atoning sacrifice for our sins. The consumption of the flesh and the cakes from off of the rock. Is that not symbolizing God's everlasting power? Well, it's it's an offering. I mean, God is is accepting an offering. Right. You're saying that it's like a fire coming down? Is that what you're talking about? I don't know that I would say fire coming down, but I mean, the way that this is presented, it says that the fire rose up. It doesn't say that the fire came down. Yeah, yeah okay. Do not our prayers need to rise up to God? Okay. Are we not seeking for the dross to be consumed? Are we not seeking for our flesh, our sins to be consumed? Yeah. So this rock itself, the flames just come from the rock. Now it's kind of obscure, but it seems like the, the flames shoot up from the rock. So the rock starts on fire. Is, I mean, in the Hebrew, is that the way it's presented? Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Yeah, well, even in the King James, the the fire rose up out of the rock. Okay. You know the word, or from the rock. Okay. When we look at this, the translators would have applied Leviticus 9.24. And there came a fire out from before the Lord and consumed upon the altar the burnt offering and the fat, which when all the people saw, they shouted and they fell on their faces. Then we have 1 Kings 18.38. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. Here we have Elijah before the people. And in 2 Chronicles 7, 1, now when Solomon had made an end of praying, the fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices and the glory of the Lord filled the house. Here is Solomon at the dedication of the temple. But in this case, the Hebrew is saying that there rose up fire from out of the rock. That seems to be the Hebrew translation into English. So we're not talking about a fire coming down, we're talking about a fire going up. So as this fire is going up, Gideon is able to see the need that he has of his reliance completely upon God. Any problems with this example? One verse that comes to me is Luke 12, 49. It's Christ speaking, and he says, I'm come to send fire on the earth, and what will I if it be already kindled? And then he goes on and says, but I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how am I straightened till it be accomplished? He was pressured. He was burdened. He was compelled. He was so concerned that his, his mission be fulfilled. Suppose ye that I'm come to give peace on earth, I tell you nay, but rather division. For from henceforth there shall be five in one house divided, three against two, and two against three. So it goes on about you know, the households being broken up because some turn to Christ and some don't. Some receive the truth, some don't. And, you know, that's by discernment. He talks about discernment and division, basically. This isn't a happy message. It's not a feel good message. Okay. It's never going to be a feel good message, is it?
is this ever going to be a feel good message? Until he says, well done, thou good and faithful servant. But while you're giving the message, does it feel good to give it? Well, feel it good. feels good in the sense that God compels me to give it sometimes, but the reactions are not always very pleasant. Okay. I don't know. I don't know what you mean by feel good giving the message. I mean, a feel good message is a message that's given to people to make them feel good. Um, I think it's irrelevant how we feel in giving a message. True, but if you go into your most of your local churches, that's what they want, smooth things. Yeah, I understand. So, But it, I'm just saying that the person giving the message, it's not about, it's not when you talk about a feel-good message, it's about the people receiving the message, not the people giving the message. Okay. Like that's all I'm saying. All right. So we have come to the end of our time today. Any other thoughts or any other comments? Well, it's going to take us a while to get through this section dealing with Gideon. Sure. Even though we've gone through it before. We're looking at information that we have looked at in the past, but looking at it with a new perspective. Mm -hmm. Okay. Shall we then close with prayer? Gracious Father, we thank you for this time that we've spent together today. We thank you for your watch, care, and your blessing in keeping this session together so that we have been able to share with other like-minded believers. Be with us today in all that you would have us to do. May your will be done. May your character be shown to all those with whom we come in contact. Be with us now. Guide us so that your will may be done and your character may be shown to all and that we may become fit for your role. For this we ask, for this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.